Good evening. Good evening. It's great to see you here this morning, or this, e this evening, actually. I'm just in a blur. This evening, let me begin by uh, welcoming you to the 37th annual Moore College Lecture Series. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm the principal here at Moore. Uh, it's always good uh, to see the student body here, so we've got uh, quite a number of students, not all of them, but quite a few. <laughs> Uh, and it's particularly exciting to welcome back graduates of the college and other friends uh, of many years and particularly if you're a first time visitor here at college you are very very welcome. Uh, we're glad you've come and we hope that you find tonight a, a wonderful time of spiritual uh, learning and enrichment but also uh, wonderful warm fellowship over supper and as we spend some time together. Now, the very first uh, series of Moore College lectures, annual Moore College lectures, were delivered uh, by Professor F.F. Bruce in 1977 and uh, later published by Paternoster Press as The Time is Fulfilled, Five Aspects of the Fulfillment of the Old Testament in the New. Since then, a long list of luminaries, both international and domestic, have delivered the annual Moore College lectures, including Jim Packer, on Preaching Christ Crucified, Broughton Knox on The Everlasting God, Don Carson on 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, Peter Jensen, Peter O'Brien, Henri Blocher, David Peterson, Paul Barnett, Gerald Bray, our own Peter Bolt, Andrew Sheed, and last year, our Vice Principal, Bill Salier. The annual Moore College lectures were set up to provide an opportunity for us all to benefit from the scholarship of leading voices in biblical and theological studies at home and abroad. And over the years, the feast has been very rich indeed. This year, we're delighted that uh, Professor Michael Horton uh, will be delivering the lectures entitled Lord and Life Giver, The Holy Spirit Changes Everything. Now, I'm going to uh, introduce Mike a little more fully in a moment, uh, but before I do that, a few small matters of housekeeping. First, if you're like me, you may have one of these things in your pocket. This would be a wonderful time to switch it off or switch it onto silent so that we can all enjoy uh, the lecture without interruption. So while I'm doing that, you might like to do that with yours. Second, uh, later uh, this evening, uh, thanks to uh, the generosity of Professor Horton, he will be um, answering questions at the end of tonight's session. Uh, if you're going to be attending next week's sessions, though, and uh, you have a question uh, that you want to ask, you might like to uh, write it down and uh, place it in the black box near the exit door of this lecture theatre. And we're hoping that at the beginning of uh, lectures later next week, uh, some of those questions will be answered as well. Uh, audio recordings of the whole lecture series will be available online, uh, free of charge, and live streaming of the lectures is happening now. Hello. <laughs> uh, if you want to follow, though, the remainder of the, the lecture series but can't attend, if you have a look at the handout notice, uh, you'll see links to how you can access the recordings. Uh, the lecture is uh, being channeled to the upper and lower lecture rooms in this block. Uh, for the convenience of parents with uh, children, with prams uh, and others who might make excessive noise. That's usually the first year. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean that. Um, after the lecture, coffee and tea will be available uh, downstairs in the common room and you're all invi invited to join us. Mike Horton is the J. Gresham Machen uh, Professor of Theology and Apologetics at Westminster Seminary, California. He's uh, been teaching there since 1998. He has a PhD through uh, Coventry University, which was researched and supervised at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. He also spent a couple of years in postdoctoral research uh, at Yale University. As well as uh, teaching, writing, pastoring, and speaking at conferences around the world, he is the editor-in-chief of the magazine Modern Reformation, which I hope many of you know, and is the president of a nationally syndicated radio program entitled The White Horse Inn, which some of you might know as well. His publishing record is as long as your arm, or longer. Uh, two of 
The earliest books that are quite well known here are Putting Amazing Back Into Grace, first published in 1991. Come up later on and tell him where you were in 1991 or how old you were and make him feel very old indeed. <laughs> and Power Religion, a collection of essays he edited along with Chuck Colson in 1992. Since then, he's been particularly well known for four books exploring themes in systematic theology in conversation with Protestant orthodoxy. Uh, Covenant and Eschatology in 2002, Lord and Servant, a Covenant Christology in 2005, Covenant and Salvation, Union with Christ in 2007, and People and Place, a Covenant Ecclesiology in 2008. His massive one-volume systematic theology, and it really is a weighty volume in more ways than one, uh, is entitled The Christian Faith, a Systematic Theology for Pilgrims on the Way, and it was published in 2000, 2011. A smaller volume approaching the whole sweep of systematic theology in, a less, uh, in, in less detail was published in the same year as Pilgrim Theology. Indeed, uh, he's published at least three books since then, and there's really no keeping up with his writing output. Every spare moment he seems to be on his computer. Um, I first met Mike uh, in 1994 at a bus stop in Oxford on the Banbury Road. He'd just finished his doctoral work and was returning to the States and I'd just arrived to begin mine. We were both supervised by Alistair McGrath and we can tell you stories that are strangely similar um, after these lectures if you like. Since then, we've run into each other um, a couple of times. A memorable visit to St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh comes to mind. Uh, but whenever we have, we've enjoyed the warm fellowship uh, that Christ gives to his people as a rich gift uh, now as we wait for that day when we will enjoy each other's company in the presence of the Lord forever. Mike is ordained in the United Reformed Church in North America. He's married to Lisa and has four children, and three of those are triplets. Uh, so, yeah, so gasps of <laughs> how could he have done this? <laughs> he obviously wasn't writing books all the time. <laughs> uh, and he is well known for a, a great sense of humour and, uh, and also for wise guidance of Christian brothers and sisters uh, in many parts of the world. We're genuinely delighted to have you with us, Mike. Uh, we've been looking forward to these lectures on the Spirit for some time and we're very grateful that you've been able to make the trip across the Pacific to join us. But before I invite you to come up and uh, give us tonight's lecture, let's uh, pray together for Mike and for ourselves as we seek to love the Lord our God with all our mind this evening. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for the rich privilege of knowing you and of living in fellowship with one another. We thank you for the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, who makes possible fellowship with you and with each other. We thank you that in him, every barrier has been torn down and we stand as your redeemed people, awaiting that day when your son will return to take us home. And as uh, this evening we gather together uh, to hear part of your word explained to us, understanding the teaching of your word about your spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you might give us uh, the attention that we need. You might give us those wise, faithful minds that test all things against your word. And we pray that the end result might be that you are honoured as you ought to be. And we are encouraged all the more to serve you faithfully as your people. We do pray for our brother as he brings this lecture to us after a, a long week of lecturing in other places that you might sustain him uh, and that you might use him to benefit us and to bring glory to Jesus' name. And all of this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Will you uh, join with me now in welcoming Mike Horton to deliver the first of his lectures entitled How the Spirit Changes Everything. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, going ahead with the invitation, despite the fact that you knew me before uh, I came to Australia. 
And uh, what an honor it is to be able to uh, deliver these lectures about which I've heard so much over the years. And when I hear that distinguished list, I can only uh, conclude that I've been asked to speak this year to put it all to a stop <laughs> and uh, serve as a contrast to everything before and after. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and especially to be able to uh, address uh, such an auspicious group on such an important topic, the Holy Spirit. Uh, tonight I will be uh, summarizing in a uh, uh, more general survey form some of the material that I'll be unpacking uh, over the next uh, week uh, for, the, uh, for the more lectures. And I will be uh, uh, offering an introduction followed by a survey of the theme, Lord and Giver of Life followed by a, a brief discussion of the farewell discourse, and finally, uh, Pentecost, how the Holy Spirit changes everything. First of all, uh, as a way of introducing the topic, sometimes there are roadblocks to uh, our focusing on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we take his work for granted and find that it's difficult to uh, wrap our arms, as it were, around the person and work of the Holy Spirit. There are various reasons for this. I'll just refer to a few. Just tick the box for which one applies to you. At various times in my own life, uh, I think I could have ticked them all. First of all, some of us uh, were raised, that is those of us uh, who are uh, the age of Mark and myself, uh, can remember the old King James Version, Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost was the spooky member of the Trinity, uh, associated uh, more with All Hallows' Eve, perhaps, than with Pentecost Sunday. Uh, the Holy Spirit was associated with the paranormal, the sensational, the extraordinary, things that go bump in the night. We weren't too sure exactly what the Holy Spirit does, but it was, it was something that happens uh, outside of the usual course of events. The Holy Spirit was associated with the extra things. Uh, the, the, you know, we, ha we have the Word, of course, but we also need the Spirit. Sure, the Father and the Son, but don't forget the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit sort of uh, was easily tacked on. There's another issue, I think, that can serve as a roadblock, and that is the tendency sometimes to collapse the Spirit into the Father or the Son. Part of this is because the, the Holy Spirit works within us invisibly, and so we uh, don't seem to have this, the, the same uh, clarity about the Holy Spirit, perhaps, that we have about the Son, uh, about whom the Gospels, uh, 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 on whom the Gospels uh, especially focus. There's also a tendency to collapse the Holy Spirit into our own inner spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is so intimately at work within us, it's easy sometimes to confuse the Holy Spirit's voice with our own inner voice. I also think that sometimes we see this confusion in our prayers. Sometimes we don't know who it is exactly we're praying to. I even hear some prayers, sometimes by pastors, they, they, where they conclude a prayer with, in your name, amen. You wonder who, who exactly are they talking to. Uh, we pray to the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. Uh, but when we say, in your name, amen, the question is raised, are we praying in the Father or are we <laughs> praying to the Father in the Son? And sometimes all of this language gets confused Precisely because we have abandoned older, wiser language, many of us grew up with, uh, that trains us to think in Trinitarian terms where the Holy Spirit has a definite place. And then also I think that uh, there's a tendency to depersonalize the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes uh, even in evangelical circles I hear the Holy Spirit referred to as an it. Uh, we never speak of the Father as an it, or the Son as an it, but sometimes we speak of the Spirit as an it. We think of the Spirit as a, as a plug, 
uh, as a power source, uh, a force or an inner principle, perhaps an inner light, uh, some kind of divine energy at the heart of the universe or somehow a divine principle within us. And so I want to focus our attention on what we mean when we confess that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life. The Lord and the giver of life. First of all, the Lord, because he is God. Uh, It sometimes causes us to swallow hard when we say with the Nicene Creed that the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. That we worship and glorify the Holy Spirit along with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is not a divine principle or a divine energy or a divine activity. The Holy Spirit is the Lord. The Holy Spirit is God. And that means the Holy Spirit possesses all of the attributes that the Father and the Son possess. Omnipotence, omniscience, aseity, impassibility, love, holiness, justice. All of the attributes of the Godhead are possessed equally and consubstantially by the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son. And yet, he's also the giver of life. He's not just divine. He's not just God sharing equally in those divine attributes. He also has his own personal attributes that distinguish him from the Father and the Son. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Nothing comes from the Holy Spirit, nor is the Holy Spirit the mediator of any of God's activities. But the Holy Spirit is the giver of life. He is the member of the Trinity who brings about the completion of God's purposes. All of God's external works, creation, providence, redemption, consummation, proceed from the Father in the Son by the Spirit. And so we should seek to avoid what I call the division of labor mistake, where we we, we tend to see the, the, the Father as the creator, the Son as the redeemer, and the Holy Spirit as the sanctifier. There's reason for that. We can't talk about everything at the same time, and it makes sense uh, to talk about uh, the Father as uh, the source of creation, the Son as the one who comes from heaven to redeem us from our sins, and the Spirit who applies redemption. But in doing so, we should never forget that in every external work of the Godhead, The Father is the source, the Son is the mediator, and the Holy Spirit is the consummator. And that's why the early church fathers said, in every external work of the Godhead, the works are undivided. So it's not that each person is engaged in a different work, but rather that each person is engaged in every work differently. In every work, the Father is the origin, the Son is always the mediator, and the Spirit is always the one who brings it to completion. Or, since Scripture often refers to God's work as the result of his powerful word, we can say, the Father speaks, the Son is the word, in whom and for whom all things exist, and the Holy Spirit is the one who brings to effect that word that is spoken. And so that's why I've titled this talk, How the Holy Spirit Changes Everything, because that is the Holy Spirit's job description. In every work of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the one who changes, more specifically, perfects every work of the Father in the Son. So what we meet in the unfolding biblical drama is not merely three personas, but three persons. Not merely three roles, but three actors. There are many ways of saying this. According to uh, the uh, 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 biblical story, we can say that the, the Father works for us, the Son works among us as one of us, and the Holy Spirit works within us. Or we can say the Father is the promise maker, Hebrews 6.13, The Son is the promise, 2 Corinthians 1.20, and the Spirit 
brings about within us the amen of faith to that promise, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, this emphasis uh, really became well-established, especially in uh, the work of the great 4th century Cappadocian fathers, from Cappadocia, what's now Turkey, particularly Basel, uh, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their friend Gregory of Nazianzus, a very uh, close group of three theologians who, by the way, were, were catechized by their big sister, Macrina. Don't forget Macrina. And... Gregory of Nyssa, for example, wrote that none of the persons executes any work apart from the others, but every operation which extends from God to the creation has its origin from the Father and proceeds through the Son and is perfected in the Holy Spirit, end quote. And it was that kind of formulation and their way of unpacking it that uh, attracted John Calvin to the Cappadocian fathers. In his own words, he said, to the Father is attributed the beginning of all action, the fountain and source of all things, to the Son, wisdom, counsel, and arrangement in action, while the energy and efficacy of all divine action is assigned to the Holy Spirit. That's that's quite an important job description for the Holy Spirit, the energy and efficacy of all action that is conducted by the Trinity in relation to creation. With that introduction behind us, we turn to the first point, the giver of life, a long and fruitful career. You know, starting with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is like walking into a movie in the middle. Uh, the, The Holy Spirit has had a long and fruitful career before he has been poured out at Pentecost. From Genesis to Revelation, From creation to consummation, the Spirit is the giver of life. That's his role in every operation of the Trinity. Even in the beginning, the Holy Spirit is the one who turns a house into a home, created space into covenantal place for communion with his creatures. The Bible's second verse reports the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, Genesis 1-2 separating, dividing, organizing, structuring. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit doesn't work apart from matter. The Holy Spirit works with matter to bring order, not confusion and chaos, but to divide and structure, take things apart and put them back together in order, separating light from darkness, sea from land, heavenly space, from earth, so that there can be a habitable place for God to have fellowship with his covenant partner. In light of further revelation, we see a two-fold role assigned to the Holy Spirit, both judicial and transformative, and I'll be talking about both of those uh, at length in, in these lectures. Judicial and transformative. In Genesis 2, 7, The Spirit breathes into Adam the breath of life, and he became a nephesh, a living being. Already in creation, the Spirit is associated with disruption, but not disruption as an end. Disruption to the end of bringing about order and life and the flourishing of life where there is no life. The Holy Spirit is the great animator. He's at work within creation to turn a chaos into a cosmos, a place to be inhabited. He is the beautifier. With their bodies clothed with splendor and royal dignity, Adam and Eve didn't even need garments to cover their bodies. For the clothing of Solomon's temple in beauty, the spirit filled the artists, we read in Exodus 31. Bazalel was filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to to craft all of the pieces uh, for the temple in a way that that fit with what God had commanded in the law for the building. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, says Yahweh, to make artistic designs 
for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts, and then lists all of the, the instruments uh, of this holy worship. The Father speaks the design. The Son is the reality to which the design points. And the Holy Spirit is the designer at work in the human artisans to bring the design to completion. Even after the fall, even in pagan cultures, the Holy Spirit beautifies ordinary people, places, and things in his common grace. It's a considerable section that I'll quote in another place from Calvin where he talks about our ingratitude to the Holy Spirit if we despise the good gifts that he's poured out even on pagans and in pagan cultures by his common grace. The Holy Spirit hovers. The Holy Spirit covers. The Holy Spirit clothes with beauty. All the more the Holy Spirit is the beautifier of the elect. If the Father is the architect and the Son is the archetype, the Spirit is the artist. The Father gives the materials. The Son is the glorious portrait. But the Holy Spirit is the one who clothes us with Christ and conforms us daily to his beautiful image. This twofold role, judicial and transformative, is seen again as early as Genesis 3.8 when the Holy Spirit comes to Adam and Eve in judgment after their transgre transgression uh, of the original covenant. Uh, it is the Spirit who comes. I mean, Ruach there can be translated, of course, wind. Uh, in in uh, the Old Testament, Ruach can mean wind. It, it can mean spirit. Uh, but here in context, it certainly seems to mean wind. Uh, sorry, the, the Holy Spirit. Because everything that follows is a covenant lawsuit. The whole setting is a trial. It's in the wake of Adam's transgression of the covenant of creation. Furthermore, in the light of further revelation, it becomes clear that the Holy Spirit is identified with judgment and justification. And it doesn't make any sense, really, of the context, uh, in my view, to, to translate Ruach spirit, uh, translate Ruach wind here. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to, talk, sense to talk about it being windy on the day when God came in judgment to Adam and Eve, much less, as some translations have it, a cool breeze. Uh, it hardly makes sense to say that, that God came with a cool breeze to arraign Adam in the courtroom and to bring justice in the light of his transgression. No, the Spirit comes in the spirit of the day. What day? The day of judgment. The Spirit comes as the judge. That's why later Jesus will refer to the Holy Spirit as another parakletos, another solicitor, another lawyer sent from God. This is already what the Spirit is doing in the garden after the transgression of the original covenant. The Spirit divided the waters of the Red Sea, delivering his nation while drowning Pharaoh's hosts in watery judgment. He's associated with circumcision, the right of cutting off, once again, separating and dividing, ordering his people into a habitable space. Similarly, in the prophets, the descent of the Spirit is associated with the last days. The Holy Spirit is the completer. The Holy Spirit is the perfecter. In Joel 2.28, we're told that in the last days, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. And Peter quotes this in his Pentecost sermon. You know that it is the last days when the Holy Spirit has been poured out. It's repeated throughout the prophets, Isaiah 2, 2, and 32, 15, and 16, Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, Ezekiel 36, 25, and 27, as well as Micah 4, 1, and Zechariah 12, 10. Mark and Luke begin with John the Baptist, who is called to prepare the way of the Lord, the angel told Zechariah that his son John will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And significantly, it's the baptizer himself who contrasts his ministry 
with the greater ministry of Jesus by pointing out that the latter is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, with the Holy Spirit and with judgment. In the Annunciation, Gabriel tells Mary that she will conceive the Son of God. Understandably, she expresses confusion and astonishment. As he is born in these last days, the Holy Spirit is associated with bringing to completion this work in the last days, bringing the Messiah into redemptive history. But how will this be, she asks, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The description of the Spirit, the, the, the Spirit's work here of coming upon Mary to overshadow Mary evokes the many instances of the Spirit's work throughout history. In fact, episkiase, uh, the Greek uh, uh, word there, uh, uh, is used in the Septuagint for the passages that I will be uh, quoting here. In Genesis 1-2, the Spirit is moving upon the waters in creation. And we find the same verb in the Septuagint, uh, used in the Song of Moses, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. Yahweh alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. Fluttering like a bird over its young. And then in Exodus 40, we read that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Septuagint renders the verb covered here as episkiaze, the same word used by the angel Gabriel in Luke 1.35. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, flutter over you, so that what is born of you will be no less than the Son of God. Like the tohu vabohu, the darkness and void of the womb of Mary herself, creation lacked any ability to bring forth life until the Holy Spirit hovered over that mass, divided it, separated it, organized it, ordered it, and then breathed life into it, even breathing life into man so he became a living being. And that is how Mary will conceive, no less than the Son of God himself. You see how the Holy Spirit works with creaturely means. We mustn't associate the Holy Spirit with things that go bump in the night. He does work mysteriously, but he works through the things that have been made, that he helped make, that he has brought to life. He works with matter in creation. He works with matter in the incarnation. He didn't, he, he didn't ex nihilo create uh, 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 flesh for the Son of God in, in the womb of Mary. She wasn't just an incubator. The Holy Spirit brought about a union of the eternal Son and our humanity, taking that humanity from the Virgin Mary. The Holy Spirit works through matter in our own salvation, the Holy Spirit applies uh, the gospel through that which is preached. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, water, bread and wine, the Holy Spirit is not associated with that which is, is just crazy and spontaneous, but that which is ordered, that which is promised, that which is sometimes even ordinary sometimes even mundane. And in the transfiguration, we see the glory cloud hovering and enveloping Jesus and his disciples. The only other time this happens is in the ascension itself in Acts 1.9, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. In both cases, the enveloping in the cloud occurs as Jesus is speaking his word. 
close association between the cloud and the word. At his own baptism by John, Jesus was already beginning to fulfill all righteousness, not only for himself, but for those whom he represented. And we read, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I always found it kind of uh, jolting (laughs) that right after this statement of this wonderful picture of the Holy Spirit descending as a dove on Jesus as he's being baptized, the Father declaring, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The very next verse says, and the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It seems anticlimactic, but actually it's not. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. You see, already immediately from the waters of baptism itself, he's, he's led out. And the verb there is actually driven out, uh, launched like a, like a ship by the Holy Spirit, driven out into the wilderness where he will fulfill what was only typologically anticipated in the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. In 40 days and 40 nights, he will recapitulate Israel's history of not trusting God. And instead of demanding the food he craved, as Adam and Israel did, he will say, man shall, shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he will do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament kings were anointed as God's designated servant with oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit's anointing. But the Messiah, anointed one, when he comes, will be anointed with the Holy Spirit himself. The prophecy is especially clear in Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And you see, his role, the role of the servant is to proclaim both the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, the spirit of the day. And that is why the spirit of the Lord is upon him to lead him out to do this. It's precisely this text, of course, that Jesus reads in the synagogue at the beginning of his public ministry, saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And because his hearers understood clearly, more clearly than many Protestant theologians today, uh, that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah of Isaiah 61. Peter proclaims that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good things and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10.38. It's no wonder they wanted to throw Jesus down a cliff after his announcement that this passage, Isaiah 61, was now fulfilled in their hearing. I share Sinclair Ferguson's verdict when he says, this aspect of the Spirit's ministry has suffered considerable neglect in the history of theology, despite noteworthy exceptions. Abraham Kuyper was right when he wrote that the church has never sufficiently confessed the influence the Holy Spirit exerted upon the work of Christ. As early as the Isaiahic portrait of the Messiah, he had been viewed as the man of the spirit par excellence, end quote. So that's one of the themes I want to be teasing out in the lectures that are to follow. See, there's a danger here of an implicit Nestorianism. Nestorianism is the heresy that separates the two natures of Christ. And so we, we can think of Christ's ministry as sometimes flipping a switch when he's When he's hungry, uh, when he's thirsty, when he's tired and has to go to sleep, when he doesn't know the hour uh, of his return, uh, it's in human mode. 
But he could just flip the switch at any moment to his divinity, and all that would be different. He wouldn't be hungry, he wouldn't be thirsty, and he'd know exactly when he's coming back. However, Jesus himself says that attributing his miracles to Satan is blasphemy, not against his divinity, but against the Holy Spirit. When we place all of the weight on Christ's deity, we neglect both his saving humanity, to which we must be united if we're to be saved, and the Holy Spirit, who is the one who effects this union. The divinity of Christ doesn't push the person and work of the Holy Spirit out of the picture. The significance of Christ's dependence on the Spirit for his vocation as the last Adam cannot be marginalized even by reverent recourse to his divinity. And I hope that this point will become clear as we move along in the story in uh, uh, coming days next week. Our Lord's dependence on the Spirit for his mission is evident also in the transfiguration scene to which I uh, 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 referred a moment ago. Just as the Spirit led the Hebrews through the Red Sea by the radiant pillar of cloud, the Spirit envelops Jesus and the disciples in the heavenly cloud with Moses and Elijah. And what are they talking about? Jesus' exodus, departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, Luke 9.34. The cloud simply is the kingdom of heaven brought to earth, its glory emanating from the Spirit. Even Christ's resurrection is attributed to the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.11. See, the Holy Spirit is the giver of life, and not just biological existence, as in the first creation when he breathed into Adam and he became a living being, but now, by raising Jesus from the dead, as the life-giving spirit, as the eschatological last man who is not just alive, but is life-giving. Eschatological life is what he brings. And because the Father gives the Son to us in and by the Spirit, the Son brings us into a relation to the Father by which we too, and by that same Spirit, amazingly, by that same Spirit, can cry out, Abba, Father, addressing God as our Father in heaven. Just as the Logos can only become flesh by the work of the Spirit, we cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12.3. So not only is the Holy Spirit the gift of the Son, the Son is first of all the gift of the Spirit along with the Father. So summary thus far, before Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave us Jesus. The Son united, sorry, the Spirit united the Son to our humanity in the incarnation, hovered over Jesus at his baptism, led him into his trial as the last Adam, sustained him in that trial, empowered him to work wonders, and vindicated him publicly by raising him from the dead. Romans 1, 4. And now, here's the kicker. And now, that same Holy Spirit unites us to the humanity he glorified by raising Jesus from the dead. So that he is now for us the first fruits of the new creation. And indwells us as the security deposit on our final redemption. Of course, Ephesians 1, 14 along with Romans 8.23 and 2 Corinthians 1.22. The Spirit makes us witnesses in God's courtroom of history. Having united us to Christ, he makes us witnesses to the ends of the earth, symbolized by the flames that appeared over the heads of each disciple at Pentecost. And so even though they were eyewitnesses to Christ's work, the disciples were not yet ready to be witnesses of Christ to the world, until they were clothed with power from on high. With echoes of Genesis 2-7, where the Spirit breathes into Adam and he becomes a living being, 
The resurrected Lord breathes on the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit in John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, not the last day of the week, the first day of the week, the birthday of the new world, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so now I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. If you want to know where the Spirit is present, you want to know where the Holy Spirit is really doing some great signs and wonders, look for the place where his word is being proclaimed, people are being baptized, and the Lord's Supper is being administered. Common things, once again, working with the material that he created together with the Father and the Son, there the Spirit is fulfilling the judicial and transformative mission of which Jesus spoke. The apocalyptic scene in Revelation 10 of the mighty angels straddling sea and land with hand raised in an oath of everlasting peace is very reminiscent of that scene in John 20, isn't it? In order to confirm this and to equip them as his ambassadors of peace, he breathes the Holy Spirit into them as his co-heirs of the new spirit-filled humanity that he's inaugurated. And then we come to the farewell sermon. All of this biblical history converges in our Lord's farewell sermon in the upper room. His disciples are understandably confused. They're even disappointed by his announcement of impending departure. You know, what, this is a new conquest. The exodus has passed. He's passed through the, the exodus, a far greater exodus than, than, than the, the exodus that was merely typological. But now it's the conquest, and right at the conquest, Joshua is going to leave? This doesn't make much sense to us. Jesus doesn't comfort them by saying, well, at least I'll be with you according to my omnipotent divine nature. Still less does he offer the pagan consolation that he'll live on in their memories and his impact as the founder of Christianity. Nor does he tell them that the church will now replace him as his ongoing incarnation. Instead, he says that he will send the Spirit promised by the Father. And what will the Spirit do? Everything that we have seen him doing in these examples I've cited, only in a remarkably unique manner because of Christ's completed work. Jesus identifies the Spirit as another parakletos, another solicitor, another attorney. The prophets were covenant attorneys. The Holy Spirit here is is described in similar language as the one who prosecutes God's covenant lawsuit. Uh, Most of our translations render this comforter. I'm not sure exactly why. Certainly that's an aspect of the Holy Spirit's work, but it hardly catches the courtroom image with which this term is associated, especially in this passage. In rabbinical literature, it meant advocate uh, or solicitor. Uh, Could refer to many examples here. Still in modern Hebrew, a paraclet is is a solicitor. Most translations render parakleton advocate in 1 John 2, 1, so I'm not sure why it's not rendered advocate here. And in the context, Jesus is talking about a covenant lawsuit. He's not just talking about comfort. That's surely associated with the Spirit's work elsewhere, but not here. First, he speaks of the world's judgment of the church, John 16, 2, as part of this farewell discourse. For all of the marvelous work of the Spirit in common grace, his saving grace is associated with bringing those 
whom the Father has chosen in the Son into union with the Son through the gospel. Jesus says he will give them the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Surprisingly, at least to the disciples, no doubt, Jesus identifies the world here, thus judged, with unbelieving Israel. His disciples will be excommunicated. They will be cast out of the synagogues and harassed, even killed. And this will be seen as an act of latreia. It will be an act of worship. The world's hatred and false accusations in the courtroom against Christ and his people is actually evidence that the Holy Spirit has been poured out. And that the Holy Spirit is at work just as he was in the earthly ministry of our Lord. Second, Jesus promises the Spirit will judge the world. Now, it's an interesting judgment. This is not the final judgment that that can only come about when Jesus, to whom all authority and power to judge has been entrusted, returns bodily. This is a different kind of judgment. This is the kind of judgment the Holy Spirit engages in, namely, a judgment within rather than upon. In other words, the Holy Spirit will work within us, convincing us of our guilt and of Christ's righteousness that we receive through faith. Those who will receive the Spirit's judgment now will not receive Christ's judgment later. Those who receive the conviction, who by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, his effectual calling, come to understand themselves as condemned and by God's grace receive the justification pronounced in Christ, will be able to stand before that great future tribunal without fear. And that's why Paul also explains, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The future has arrived but only when Jesus leaves. That's what the disciples don't understand, and I don't blame them. It is after these things happen, and after the Holy Spirit is poured out, that they begin to understand what is happening, which is evidence in the fact that Peter knows what Old Testament passages to quote in the Pentecost sermon. Jesus' hour, especially in John's Gospel, means his defeat as far as his enemies are concerned, but in reality it means his victory. Not even the disciples get this, but they will when the Holy Spirit brings it all to mind. When this other attorney comes, Jesus instructs, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The, the verb here for convict is to expose. This is what lawyers do. They, they expose. They bring uh, that which is hidden to light. Satan is already judged, we read in verses 10 and 11. Again, we're in chapter 16 of John. Through Jesus' victory, the prosecutor of the brethren is defeated so that now the prosecutor of the world and justifier of believers can begin his recovery mission. And the primary reference here, of course, is to Pentecost, although its reverberations reach us even today, which is why we're here tonight, the ends of the earth. This is the prophet's role, to witness to God's righteousness and the covenant partner's violation of the stipulations of the covenant. Only now we don't have Old Testament prophets, but the Holy Spirit himself bringing about conviction within us because what is proclaimed by the servants of the word, not only the external word do we have, but now, unlike Israel under the old covenant, we have the Holy Spirit working within us, dwelling within us, circumcising our hearts to embrace both our guilt and God's grace.
And that's why the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is the archetype of all prophets. The Holy Spirit is associated with judicial and transformative functions. Jesus tells the disciples that they are qualified as apostolic witnesses, for you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 15, verse 27. Unlike the false shepherds of Jeremiah, they had stood in the counsel of the Lord. They didn't come with their own word. They, they were ready to give witness to what they had seen and heard, but that wasn't sufficient. They had yet to be clothed with power on, on high, from on high in order to be made witnesses to the ends of the earth. Yes, you have been with me from the beginning, he tells, tells them, but the Holy Spirit has really been with me from the beginning, and he's the one I'm going to send. You're not man enough, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit whom my Father promised when I reach heaven's gates. The Spirit's ministry is not to add something to Jesus' work, but to remind the disciples of everything that Jesus has said. He tells them in chapter 16, verse 12. All of this part of the farewell discourse still. And that's the basis for the New Testament as revealed scripture. The Holy Spirit inspires the words of the apostles and then illumines us to understand and embrace them. As Jesus didn't speak on his own authority, but spoke whatever his father told him, so now the Spirit will speak the word of Christ and keep the church in the truth. He isn't a freelance operator. He doesn't have his own words. Rather, he brings about the completion or perfection of that word spoken already by the Father in the Son. The Trinitarian fellowship is obvious here. The Father sent the Son, and the Son took what belonged to the Father and gave it to his people. The Son returned to his Father after having accomplished his work and then sent the Spirit, whom Jesus says will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so we can be certain where the Spirit is active in power, not where cavities are being filled with gold and legs are being lengthened, and uh, uh, people are fainting and swooning, but wherever Christ is being sincerely and simply proclaimed in all his saving office for the forgiveness of sins, justification, and an inheritance in the new creation. Finally, Pentecost. At Pentecost, everything that Jesus said in the farewell discourse about the coming of the Holy Spirit is finally fulfilled. Think of Peter. Peter had recently denied Jesus three times to a little girl. And now he's standing up and boldly preaching Jesus Christ as God, as the fulfillment of all of the expectations of the Old Testament on the temple steps themselves. Yet this proclamation of Christ, however bold, would have fallen on deaf ears as it did for the most part during Jesus' ministry, apart from the outpouring of the Spirit. But what happens? Peter outwardly proclaims the law. You crucified him with your wicked hands. But then he proclaims the gospel. He was crucified by the foreordination of God and raised by the Father on the third day for the forgiveness of your sins. And through this external proclamation of the word, through this creaturely action of a simple fisherman, the Holy Spirit convicts them of sin and of the righteousness that comes through faith. And what is the response? Cut to the quick. They say, brothers, what must we do to be saved? The chief effect is not that they will be miracle workers or hold power over nations, but that they will be given the power of the keys to forgive sins in his name. 
Besides the legal or judicial aspect, the Spirit's separating work is also identified with transformation, with cleansing. Wherever the Holy Spirit hovers, death comes to life. Deserts are made lush gardens. The common land is made holy. Moses, you recall, was horrified by the prospect of the Lord refusing to maintain his presence with his sinful people. If you do not send your presence with us, if that cloud doesn't keep going, that pillar and that fire, if that witness, that legal covenantal witness is not on our side in the courtroom, there will be nothing that separates us from the nations. The same spirit who hovered as a canopy over his people, making them holy, indwells us so that we say our amen to God in Christ, crying, Abba, Father, as adopted children and co-heirs with Christ. The Spirit performs the prophesied circumcision of the heart within us, cutting us off from the passing evil age, cutting us off from the night, making us children of the day, and unites us to Christ, working within us also to bear the fruit of the Spirit. He turns a house into a home. He beautifies. And immediately upon taking up his residence, he begins to cleanse our hearts from the defilements of sin. He doesn't come to hearts that have prepared the house for him. He comes and takes up his residence and begins then and there to clean it up himself. In all of these ways, we see the Spirit as the one who consummates the work of the Father in the Son. And now, with respect to the new creation, we see him poured out in these last days as he vivifies dead twigs and unites them to the living vine. And that's why we know we're living in the last days, because the Holy Spirit has been poured out. Like Noah's dove that brought the leafy twig as a harbinger of life beyond the watery grave, the Spirit brings us not only previews of coming attractions, but the renewing energies of the age to come themselves. Of course, the visible effects of this consummation will only be apparent fully and universally when Christ, our head, returns bodily. But even now, even now, he regenerates us. He gives us faith to be united to Christ for a sure resurrection in glory. The future verdict of the last judgment has been rendered in the present because the Holy Spirit has brought us inward conviction of our sin and faith in Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who places and preserves us at the precarious intersection of these two ages. He puts us there. And we're disturbed, <laughs> as the disciples were. It's a difficult place to be, but he preserves us there, too. It's that disorienting tension between the already and the not yet, but what an already it is. The spirit who refreshes the streams of everlasting joy in God's everlasting Sabbath indwells us now as a deposit, and that's what it means for him to be a down payment or a deposit. He is the host, as it were, of the age to come. And he indwells us as a security deposit on that wonderful day. We see the qualitative difference that Pentecost brings, therefore. Whatever wonderful experience the Old Testament saints had of the Holy Spirit, something qualitatively different has changed. Even with Jesus among them, the disciples stand on the Old Covenant side of the great divide of the two ages. He says this even in one sentence in this farewell discourse. He dwells with you now, but he will be in you. Whatever graces the Holy Spirit gave to the disciples before Pentecost, the real division in history is pre-Pentecost and after. We are contemporaries in a very real sense of the apostles after Pentecost. 
because we too know Jesus, not just after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Only when the Holy Spirit came did the disciples know Jesus in a way they had never known him before. Not his favorite color, not what tree he would be if he were a tree, <laughs> not what his personality was like, not, not, not where he liked to go on holiday, but the most important thing about Jesus, that he is the Messiah come to save sinners and that he brings the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance in him in the everlasting Sabbath. Still today, brothers and sisters, these miracles happen all the time. Those who lie in darkness, spiritually dead, are raised to new life. From every race, tongue, and people, <clears throat> to the external word of the law and the gospel, the Holy Spirit joins his inward witness that believers are adopted children and co-heirs with Christ. And because we are chosen, redeemed, called, justified, <coughs> we rest securely in the ongoing work of the sanctifying spirit who not only is engaged in a judicial mission to assure us of our justification, but in a transforming mission to make us like Jesus Christ himself. Because of the spirit, Jesus is not a figure in history for us to emulate, merely. Because of the Spirit, we can actually be inserted into the eschatological life of the man whom he raised from the dead, united to his glorified flesh so that our final resurrection is already certain. You see, we need God for us in Christ. But we also need God within us in the Spirit. Without that, we aren't united to Christ. John Calvin put it well. Uh, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. All that Christ possesses is nothing to us unless we grow into one body with him. And this can only happen by the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. Not only for higher critical scholars, but even for the disciples, and even for us today, Jesus would have remained a historical figure apart from Pentecost. No matter how great his objective work for us, apart from the Spirit's subjective work within us, apart from the Holy Spirit inspiring the sacred witness of the apostles, even the disciples would have remained erstwhile friends of this historical Jesus, but never co-heirs with him of an everlasting estate. Memories of what he said and did would fade into the ever-distant past. It is the Spirit who causes us to recognize the Jesus of history as the Christ of faith. And because of what Christ accomplished, absolutely, but also because of what the Holy Spirit has made of Jesus and does within us to unite us to him, the age to come has broken into this present evil age. The kingdom of everlasting Sabbath has been inaugurated. The days of this present evil age are now numbered. The Father speaks the liturgy of grace. The Son is himself its embodiment. And the Spirit works in the children of disobedience like you and me to create a choir of antiphonal response that answers back its appropriate amen behind its glorified forerunner. He who has prepared us for this very thing, immortality, is God who has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Amen.
Well, friends, there's a great deal for us to, uh, to digest and think about, but it may be that already uh, questions have begun uh, to emerge in your mind that you'd like uh, Mike to answer. And we've got a few moments, only a few moments, to do that now. Uh, I'm going to field the questions uh, and uh, try to repeat them, if I understand them, and, uh, and then give Mike an opportunity to answer them briefly. And of course, remember, if you don't get a chance to ask your question tonight, you could write it down and it can be answered in the lectures ahead. So would anybody like to uh, begin and ask a question? Yes. Um, I've got a question just about the, the corporate versus individual nature of the spirit dwelling in us. You touched a little bit on that tonight in terms of the pre-cross reality and there was a, an image of a bird hovering over a nest that was actually quite interesting for me. Um, how, does, how do you see that? Does, does the Holy Spirit kind of live, us, live in us individually or does he kind of hover through the elect, so to speak? Mm. A corporate and individual indwelling of the Spirit. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Great question. The, I'll deal with that more uh, fully in the final lecture, The Spirit and the Bride. Uh, but just sort of a, a quick uh, anticipation. It's a... Um, we, we, have, we have references to the Holy Spirit indwelling each believer, uh, but then we also have uh, the Holy Spirit indwelling the whole church as his body. And I, I don't think it's, it's an either or. What's really remarkable in the New Covenant uh, is not that he indwells his church. He indwelt the temple uh, in, the, in the Old Covenant. What's really amazing uh, is that he not only indwells the church as a whole, but that he indwells each and every member uh, of his body. The thing is, that doesn't make us individualistic in our relationship to God. Just, just the opposite. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes us ecstatic. In other words, turned outward, outside of ourselves. Anyone who is united to Christ by the Spirit is united to Christ's body. And it's the Holy Spirit who more and more makes us realize our union with Christ simultaneously with our communion with his body. Yes. Thank you very much. Ministry at White Horse Inn as well. So thank you for the impact you're having there. Um, you mentioned Calvin and um, the, the way the Holy Spirit has um, an impact on all people, that common grace idea of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's one thing which kind of interested me over the years. A couple of people have mentioned it. Like, um, I feel weird dropping theological names, but um, Augustine mentions the way that um, somehow Christ um, leads us into truth, and or actually all people into whatever truth they come into contact to. Um, and then Van Til kind of talks about the all of reality being personal because it's related to God. I'm just wondering. In what way is the Holy Spirit operating in or amongst unbelievers um, just in everyday things like with Augustine language or with Van Til knowledge? Good. Yeah, uh, great. There's a, a great quote. Again, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll quote the thing verbatim, I think, in the second uh, lecture. But there's this great place where. Uh, Calvin, Calvin is provoked by the, he calls them the fanatics, it's the radical Anabaptists who are arguing uh, that the, uh, uh, at least in his day, that you, you ought not to read non-Christian books, there's no reason that you should rely on non-Christian wisdom and, and education and arts and so forth, uh, invest all your time only in uh, holy things. and. Uh, Calvin says that is an insult to the Holy Spirit. He says, are we, uh, are we to say that, that, that uh, mathematicians gave us the ravings of madmen? Uh, I'm not particularly good at math, so that one doesn't bother me as much, but uh, uh, were, were all of the philosophers crazy? What about the ones who taught us how to reason and to argue well? 
What about uh, all of the wisdom that we find in the ancients even when it comes to uh, laws, laying down laws and the great uh, judicial systems uh, uh, that are apparent outside of Israel? What do we do with all of this? He says, uh, let us, let us uh, not despise them without realizing at the same time we're despising the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that even after uh, humanity has been despoiled of its true end, it nevertheless has been left with all of, all of these lovely ornaments. And so it's really, it, it, it strikes, when I read, I, the first time I read that, I was kind of uh, blown away because I don't think, of, I didn't think of the Holy Spirit as associated with giving gifts to, uh, to Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and agnostics and so forth to decide good court cases and create just laws and to make beautiful art and music. But wow, the, of course that's the Holy Spirit. In common grace, the Holy Spirit is, is working, not even in holy things, not just in holy things, as with the building of the temple, but even in common things. Just the fact that the, the Code of Hammurabi, which predates the Law of Moses, uh, it, it is in many ways very similar to the Law of Moses. Where does that come from? Uh, it doesn't just come from the fact that we're all created in the image of God, that's true, but it also comes from the Holy Spirit. He is hovering over the whole creation, but in different ways. In common grace, uh, bringing about the flourishing of life under the sun, as it were, but in saving grace, bringing the powers of the age to come into this present evil age. Um, you mentioned that the real division is pre-Pentecost and now, and um, we see in the New Testament talks about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, etc. How and does it differ pre-Pentecost in terms of fruit of the Spirit? Because we see in many times um, it says God's Spirit is with Him, so different people and at different times, mm -hmm. and so. Did it manifest differently or the same and how and when? And this is going to sound really tacky, but that's the third lecture. <laughs> uh, the age of the spirit. Basically, what we call the, you know, it's the age of the spirit. It's in the last days I will pour, pour out my spirit. All of these emphases. Uh, Jesus says the Holy Spirit right now is with you, <coughs> but he will be within you. Uh, all of these very clear markers that something not just quantitatively, I believe, but qualitatively new is happening uh, with Pentecost. Unpacking that without overplaying the discontinuity between what, what the Old Testament saints and what <coughs> New Testament saints have is, as I'm far, sure uh, uh, exegetes far better than I here uh, will attest, is a very difficult business. So when I do it, I'm doing it in the full knowledge that uh, I will, I will need pushback while I'm here. I'm just, you know, it, it's very difficult. You, on one side, one hand, you, wanna, you have to affirm that they were, that, that they, they too with us uh, inherit the kingdom, but in some sense had to wait for us in order to get there. Perhaps we make this the last question. Bruce. Um, Dr. Horton, um, it's interesting when you mentioned the, the danger of Nestorianism in associating particular works with um, either of the natures of Christ. Um, and you also mentioned the role of the Holy Spirit in the Incarnation. Um, it, it made me wonder, should we also speak of uh, a role of the Holy Spirit in the communication of properties? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, There's only a, a 500 your debate between uh, Lutherans and the Reformed. Uh, the communication of properties uh, refers to, uh, very. it's a very important debate. I don't mean to, to uh, um, say it's not, but it's a, a long debate to try to summarize um, and answer uh, on the time that we have, but I'll try to be very quick about it. Uh, according to, as I understand it, according to uh, uh, the Lutheran view, the reason that Christ can be present bodily 
in more than one place uh, is because the attributes of his divine nature can be communicated to his human nature. So he can be physically omnipresent, or at least physically present wherever he decides to be. Whereas uh, in the Reformed Christology, the two natures are so united in one person that whatever is true of one nature can be said of the whole person. So we can talk about the blood of God as we, as we read in Acts. Uh, uh, we can say God died for our sins uh, because according to his manhood, he died and the person who died is God. But we can't say that he died according to his deity. And so we say that the attributes of each nature remain unimpaired, the language of Chalcedon, remain unimpaired, undivi undivided, but also non not confused. They retain all of their properties, and they're, yet they're united in one person, so that we don't say, for example, uh, only uh, Jesus died for our sin, sins, but God didn't, because the, the Jesus who died for our sins is God. Is that sort of? So I was just interested, should we speak of um, maybe a role of the Holy Spirit in the communication of properties, uh, given your comments for the role of the Holy Spirit in the incarnation? Maybe we can talk afterwards. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the Holy Spirit's role in the communication of the properties. If we're talking about uh, what I would take to be a Chalcedonian uh, definition of the communicatio. It, the Holy Spirit is the one by whom the Logos assumed our humanity. But I'm not sure exactly how that addresses what you're after with the, the communication of attributes or properties. Maybe we can talk afterwards. Sorry, I don't understand you exactly. Friends, will you join me again in thanking uh, Dr. Hawkins? In just a few minutes, uh, supper awaits uh, downstairs, and I hope that you can stay with us and just uh, enjoy the fellowship a little while longer. Um, one or two things to mention beforehand. If you are visiting us tonight, but you have no opportunity to be with us next week when uh, we'll hear five more lectures from Professor Horton on the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm sorry for you. Uh, but. Uh, those lectures will be live streamed and they will be available on the web and you will have an opportunity to catch up with them. You just won't have the joy of being in the same room with us uh, as we hear those lectures next week. And you might like to know, if you're not going to be here, that next year's lectures, uh, following a similar format, are going to be delivered by Professor Kevin Van Hooser from uh, Trinity International University in Chicago. Uh, the first lecture uh, next week, uh, next Monday, uh, begins at 10 a.m. here in this room. And so if you'd like to join us, 10 a.m. next Monday, and we'll begin that series of five morning lectures on the Holy Spirit. And we've already had a taste tonight of how good that's going to be. But now, before we go and uh, share supper together, uh, let's once again thank our Lord for all that he's given us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had tonight to think on you, on your spirit, on your son. We thank you that you have given us your spirit. We thank you that through him we are able to call upon you as father. We thank you for uniting us by your spirit to your son, that all the benefits of his perfect life, his atoning death and his glorious resurrection might be ours now. We thank you that through him and because of him there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So as we rejoice in the work of your spirit in us and the work of your spirit in all the world, uh, we pray that you might give us wisdom to test all that we hear against your word, to hold on to the things that are true and to let those things that are not true fall to the ground so that we might be found testifying to you as you are and speaking your truth to the world that desperately needs to hear it. And so once again, thank you for all you've given us, Father, tonight.
through your servant and through our fellowship together. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>